Good afternoon. Welcome to our April Sugar CRM user group. Um, as usual, I am your host, Deneen Pontarelli, Director of Marketing for Technology Advisors. And today we're going to be going over the new features of the Sugar release. Um, before we get started, quick thing. I know a lot of you have joined us for several of these calls, but um, in case you have not seen this platform before, Note that um, especially when Megan and Justin are showing their demos, I know sometimes it can be hard to see. Um, if you if you want, you can expand that slide screen as large as you can go. Um, that might help uh, for volume control, use your media player. And then uh, you'll notice the resource list. We have quite a few resources for you today, um, and you can have access to those at any time throughout the presentation. In addition to that, there's also the speaker bios below if you'd like any more information or contact uh, info for me or either of our hosts. So our hosts today are Megan Sheehan, our sugar trainer and business analyst, and Justin Kielthal, our sugar practice manager. And as I mentioned, we're going to be going over new features in Sugar 8 highlighting some of those GDPR features that everyone's very interested in. Um, we'll be talking about new and upcoming releases, and then upcoming events, um, you know, training events that we're having, user groups, live events, and we'll take your questions at any time throughout, so feel free to enter them into that Q&A box when you have one. So I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to Megan and Justin to get us started. All right, thanks, Deneen. So we're going to start by talking about a few of the features in Sugar 8 that are not GDPR related, and then we'll dive deeper in the, into the GDPR related features after that. The first thing I want to mention is a reminder that Sugar 8 is a roll-up release for on-premise customers. So last late summer, early fall, Sugar announced their new release schedule with quarterly releases for on-demand customers and a once-a-year release for on-premise customers. And part of that annual on-premise release is that it's obviously going to include any of the new features that came out in the previous uh, cloud-only or on-demand-only releases. So in this case, if you are an on-premise customer, when you upgrade to Sugar 8, you're not only getting the new features that we're talking about today from Sugar 8, but you're also getting the new features from version 7.10 and 7.11, or alternately called the Fall 17 and Winter 18 releases, depending on which naming convention you want to use. We have talked in depth about those features in previous user groups, so I don't want to go too far into those today, just kind of high-level reminders. That's going to include shareable dashboards, uh, drill down into dashboard charts, converting the emails and contracts modules to the sidecar user interface, the new look and feel that came out in 7.11 with the new color scheme and new fonts and all that good fun stuff, the product catalog dashlet for quoting that came out in 7.11, as well as uh, the need to register any custom platforms that you're using for integrations. Um, there is a new admin tool in version 8 to make that registration process easier. So whereas in version 7.11 you had to up update or upload a module uh, package through the module loader, um, in Sugar 8, they're introducing an admin tool where you can simply just type in the name of your custom platform in order to allow that platform to connect to your Sugar instance. So if you do have any integrations and you are upgrading to version 7.11 or version 8.0, please do make sure you keep that in mind. You need to allow those integrations access to your Sugar API. Uh, otherwise, the API is going to start blocking them and your integration will stop working. One of the other features that is included in version 8.0 are some enhancements to the product catalog dashlet that first came out in 7.11. So in version 7.11, the product catalog works, or the product catalog dashlet works with quotes. In version 8.0, they're expanding that to work with any other uh, modules in Sugar, in particular anywhere that has revenue line items connected to it. So on the opportunity create screen, on the opportunity or account record views, um, and read-only form available from anywhere. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. If I can find the button to do that. There it is. 
and pull up Sugar 8. And the first thing I'm going to do is create a new opportunity here. And this is a Sugar instance that's got the Revenue Line Items feature enabled. Uh, that is a Sugar Enterprise and Above feature. So you might not know what Revenue Line Items are if you're using Professional. Uh, that's okay. This just wouldn't apply to you then. And what the new product catalog dashlet will do in version 8.0 is allow you to add products to an opportunity right from the widget. So I can click on any of these products, and it's going to go ahead and automatically populate revenue line items for me for my opportunity based off of the catalog information. So the pricing and the um, other information that's available from the catalog, instead of me having to search on a line-by-line -line basis to add those products in, making that much faster and easier for me. So I go ahead and just fill out some required fields here. We can save our new opportunity with those revenue line items attached to it. And if I need to go back and add additional products after I've initially created my opportunity, I can use the product catalog dashlet for that as well. So if I want to add this desktop to it, that's going to just pop up the revenue line item create screen for me to finish filling out the rest of the revenue line item data. And I can, again, quickly and easily get that added to my opportunity uh, as a revenue line item. The dashlet does work from any screen, so if I was looking at, say, my opportunity list view, I can have the product catalog dashlet displayed here. It just obviously doesn't have the context where it would make sense to add revenue line items from it, so it's really just display only purpose if you're wanting to look at your catalog and see what products you have in there or anything like that. You can go ahead and view the product catalog from anywhere, um, but um, the only place where it would have the functionality of adding revenue line items is places where it would make sense. All right, so jumping back to the presentation here, um, there are, of course, a number of GDPR-related features. We're going to be going through those in a lot more detail. Uh, but before we do that, Justin's going to talk a little bit about some of the platform updates in Sugar 8. Thank you, Megan. Uh, with Sugar 8, Sugar has now started to support the most recent versions of the entire stack. PHP 7.1 is the most recent version of PHP, and it is supported until December of 2019. Uh, Apache 2.4, again, is the most recent version of Apache. I'm unsure when it's supported to, the foreseeable future, many years, because they've been on the 2.x version since 2004, I believe. Uh, then we have MySQL 5.7. Actually, 8.0 was released seven days ago, but I would expect 5.7 to be supported for many years to come. On Elasticsearch 5.4 or 5.6, 5.4 has an end of life of November 4th, 2018, and 5.6 has an end of life date of March 11th, 2019. So if you're planning to do a new on-premise install, obviously you'd want to go with the most recent version, 5.6, so you get that longer end of life date. If you're upgrading Sugar to version 8, you're going to have to upgrade to 5.4 or 5.6. And you should note that Elasticsearch indexes do not upgrade. So you'd have to either build a new server or uninstall the old version and install a new cluster or new version and just have Sugar rebuild the indexes. It just doesn't generally take very long. You just do that through the admin tool and you get some new indexes. Okay, so before we dive into what Sugar is introducing in terms of new features related to GDPR, we figured we better give you a little bit of background information on GDPR in case this is a fairly new topic for you. Um, we are not obviously lawyers, so legal disclaimer, we can't give you legal advice. Talk to lawyers before you make decisions uh, related to GDPR and other compliance issues. And we're also not uh, GDPR experts in any strong depth of the topic. We're trying to give you some basic background information. If you're looking for more in-depth information, I'd recommend checking out the series of webinars that our marketing team has done related to GDPR. 
and those links should be available in that resources section that Denise mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. All right, with all that introductory information out of the way, uh, what is GDPR? So GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation, which is a law passed by the EU uh, that imposes obligation on any business in any country that handles data of EU citizens. So if you do anything with any data that pertains to people who are citizens of the EU, even though you may not be based in the EU, this law does apply to you. And this is going into effect on May 25th, 2018. It was passed, I feel like it was about a year ago, if I'm remembering correctly. So it's been coming for a while, but it is rapidly approaching the point where this is actually going to take effect and you need to be in compliance for, uh, for GDPR. GDPR guarantees certain rights for individuals, and those individuals, again, are EU citizens. So even if you're a United States company and you happen to have an EU citizen living in Chicago, Illinois, and they happen to be a customer of yours, then that is still covered by GDPR. And that gives these EU citizens the right to be informed so they can always call up your company and you have to tell them if they have you have data about them and what that data is and where you got it or how you got it. Uh, they have to be, again, in a similar way, they have to be able to access that data, whether that's a phone call or a portal, and they have to be able to fix that data or even erase it. And that's what we're going to be showing a little with the new sugar functionality is how can we purge all of that data once a erasure request has come in. It also includes some restrictions on how you can process data, move it around, and share it. A few of the core principles that are built into GDPR are listed here. Um, that's going to include accountability, meaning that you as a business have to be able to demonstrate that you are complying with GDPR and you need to keep accurate records of your data processing activities to validate that whatever uh, personal information you're using is in compliance with GDPR. So it's up to you to be able to prove that what you're doing is in compliance with the rule, with the law. Another pri core principle is privacy by design. What that means is as you roll out new business processes or new product lines or new products, you need to have GDPR compliance in mind as part of the design for your new process or your new product. Privacy by default means that your defaults for collecting, processing, and storing data should be as privacy friendly as you can make them. Uh, so for example, if you have a data retention policy, you should be able to explain why you know, you're retaining this data for six months or 12 months or five years, whatever the period might be, uh, that there's a reason that the period needs to be that long, that it couldn't be shorter for X reason. And it also uh, requires you to be responsible for assessing the impact of the data that you're processing. So it's up to you to determine the risk level and the appropriate actions to take based on that risk level in terms of how you're processing and storing data. A few of the key terms that you'll hear people using when they're discussing GDPR, um, one is personal data or personally identifiable information, PII. This refers to the data that is covered by GDPR. Um, personal data from GDPR means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person, aka data subject. Uh, someone who can be identified directly or indirectly, in particular by reference to an identifier such as a name, an ID, a number, location, uh, physical, physiological, genetic, economic, and so on data. So personal data includes not just names, phone numbers, and email addresses, things that you might immediately think about as being personal data, but also includes IP addresses and cookies information that you can use to track back to a specific person. Um, and GDPR does give special concern or special protection around more sensitive data that might include you know, health or genetic data or any of that sort of information. 
a data controller in GDPR is someone who determines the purposes for which personal data will be processed, aka the data controller for the data that your business is using is you. You are the one who has primary responsibility under GDPR for making sure that you are in compliance with GDPR. A data processor is someone other than you or your employees um, who might be processing data on behalf of the data controller. In other words, Sugar would be a data processor of the data that you're keeping in Sugar. And again, the primary responsibility for compliance with GDPR rests with the data controller. All right, again, just to briefly touch on who does this apply to, any citizen of any European Union country is covered by GDPR, whether or not they're living in the EU or abroad, and even non-citizens of the EU living in the EU. So again, if you're a United States-only company, but you have some guy you may not even know if a person is a citizen of the EU who's a customer of yours, you would still be liable for that. Um, some other reasons why it's a good idea to get in compliance with GDPR is because other jurisdictions are likely to follow the EU, and even Canada has the CASA law that they passed some time ago, which is kind of similar. Uh, in addition, compliance will give your company a better reputation, and comp I've heard that Compliance can lead to better marketing. It's not all about getting as much information as possible and spamming people anymore. It's about more targeted marketing emails and campaigns, as well as bringing back some of the older marketing techniques like, like niche, niche industry specific trade shows or events and other things like that. So there are a lot of benefits you can get out of GDPR, and more than likely down the road you're going to have to be in compliance. So you might as well get in compliance now. Okay, so now that we all have some background information on what GDPR is, let's take a look at what Sugar is introducing in Sugar 8 to help you act in compliance with GDPR. We're going to be diving in deeper to each of these, but at a really high level, uh, the key features that Sugar is introducing here include the ability to mark data as PII, that personally identifiable information category, um, the ability to manage data subject requests, such as requesting a copy of their data, like Justin mentioned, or the ability to um, the request to export or erase their data. And of course, introducing the ability to erase data from sugar modules and audit logs so that you can comply with those erasure requests. I've got a link here on the screen. Again, that's gonna be in your resources section, and I'm sure Deneen will send it out in her follow-up email as well. Um, if you're looking for more details, Sugar does have a really nice blog post on their community explaining exactly how the new features that they're introducing line up with GDPR, even citing specific articles of GDPR that they're lining up with. Okay, so how do we track PII in Sugar? Well, they've made it very easy with just an additional checkbox in the studio. You can see here in the screenshot that there is a checkbox labeled personal information and it even has a little help screen that will tell you all of the different places that this checkbox will affect in Sugar. It makes it really easy to go into your system and start checking things that you need to track. Things like name, email address, phone number, uh, among a lot of other data that could be considered PII. Many of the new GDPR-related features in Sugar are managed through a new module that they're introducing called Data Privacy. Um, so the Data Privacy module is designed to help you manage and track your data privacy-related requests. So as people do request an export of their data or to know what information you've got about them or to have data erased, this gives you a place to manage those requests, make sure you're not losing, tr keeping, or losing track of any of those, you're keeping track of them. Um, it also gives you a place to track the fact that you have followed through on those requests, going back to that accountability requirement. This is going to allow you to note when the request was completed and the actions that you took based off of that request. 
There are a lot of request types built into the module already. Um, again, going back to that list of rights that Justin defined, Sugar has matched those two various request types within the data privacy module. Um, so requesting a privacy policy, send me my personal information, request, erase information, export, and so on. Um, and in particular, there is a lot of functionality that Sugar built into this data privacy module around erasure, erasure requests. So obviously this is something that has to be handled in a very careful way because if someone requests to have their data erased, GDPR requires that you do in fact release it, re erase it unless you have a reason to reject that request, in which case of course you would track the rejection and communicate that back to someone as to why you can't delete their data. Um, you have some sort of relevant business purpose where you still need that information. So within the data privacy module, um, Sugar has added a special process to erase data from Sugar. This process is restricted to system administrators and users uh, who have been given access to the data privacy manager role. This is a new role that Sugar has added to the uh, role management section of the administrator tools, and you can add one or more users into this role in order to give them access to be able to process these erase requests. And a really key point here to note is that erasing is different than deleting. So if you delete a contact from your database, uh, that's going to delete that entire contact record, first of all, um, not just selected data that actually needs to be deleted. So it's a little bit broader in that sense that it, it's taking a broad stroke and deleting everything when maybe you could retain some data and just have to delete the personal uh, PII data. But also, deleting data doesn't necessarily actually remove it from your database. Uh, Sugar does, by default, a soft delete of data. So the data actually stays in your database. It's just not accessible through the user interface. And that's actually not enough in terms of compliance with GDPR. GDPR requires that, that data be truly erased, and so um, deleting would not necessarily meet that, that need. One important note, and this is going to come back up again later on a related slide, is that Sugar's erasure process is going to remove erased data from the audit logs, um, but not from the activity stream. So more about that in a few minutes. And I will demo the erasure process in just a second. One more slide before I do. Um, a couple of other notes. The data privacy module in Sugar does work with custom modules. So if you have built any custom modules in Sugar that contain personally identifiable information, all you have to do in order to use the data privacy module with your custom modules is add a relationship in Studio uh, between the data privacy module and your custom module. And it also, of course, works with custom fields. Uh, Justin showed you earlier that PII flag that is now available in Studio. And that's what you use to mark which fields contain PII, which is therefore the data that's available for erasing. All right, so let's go ahead and hop over into Sugar. I'm in the data privacy module now. And you can see I've got data in here with a variety of different request types. I've got the ability to track different statuses for whether those requests have been completed or not, or not as well as priority, um, source, and so on. So let's go into this erasure request. And in this case, uh, it looks like Gary has contacted us and asked us to erase his PII information. So that request um, you know, should go through your process for evaluating if that request should be accepted uh, or if there's a business reason to reject that request. And then assuming that we have de decided to go ahead and erase their data, um, I'm going to first want to make sure that there are not multiple records in Sugar with Gary's information. If Gary might have a lead record and a contact record, um, or maybe even several lead records, depending on my marketing process, if he's filled out various forms over time. So I'm going to use my global search tool to first do a search for Gary. And it looks like the only result is the contact that I've already got linked here. So I don't have to worry about that. 
but the process has been built in such a way that I can link multiple records in here into this erasure request, and I can mark data to be erased from all of them before I actually process the erasing. So the way I do that marking um, is through this mark to erase action. And this in particular is the feature that is locked down to administrators and users in that data privacy manager role. So your regular users won't see mark to erase, only users who you've, you've um, selected to give access to this function will have that function available. When I choose mark to erase, Sugar is going to bring up a list of all of the fields flagged as PII for this contact. And so I can see here are all of my PII fields. Here's the value of the fields for Gary, if we have data available in those fields. Um, and here's the source and the last update date for those fields. And now depending on what Gary requested, I might have to delete all of his PII data. Or maybe he's only requested that I delete certain fields, in which case I can select just the fields that he's requested me to delete. Once I have selected the fields that I need to delete, I'll go ahead and mark those fields for erasure. And this is where if I had multiple records that I needed to go through and process, I would repeat that step. So if I had multiple contacts, there were some duplicates, or if I had leads from various sources, I could mark each of them for erasure. Once I've completed doing that for each record, then I want to go ahead and process the erasing. And so that's when I would click this green erase and complete record here at the top. I do get a warning to make sure that I am actually ready to click that button. I fully understand I'm going to permanently erase the data from 31 fields, and there is no way to recover that data after I've erased it because, again, GDPR requires me to truly erase that data. So I'll go ahead and do that. And if we go ahead and refresh this list now, we can see Sugar's actually added, a, I call it a pill, a little tag-like thing here, um, where I can see that those values have been erased. Um, they were also smart enough to add in a link that I could click if the name has been erased, because obviously the name usually serves as the link. And so I can come in here and I can see, you know, the reason I don't have some of these data fields filled out is because Gary has requested that they be deleted, or in this case someone, I don't know who anymore, has been has requested they be deleted. Um, if I get consent later, that data gets reprovided to me. I can always edit these fields and fill them out again in the future. Um, so there's no restriction from me populating that data back in if and when I get consent to track that data again. All right, so that's what the erasure process looks like. Part of GDPR is also managing consent for being able to contact people. And it's not just a blanket consent. Yes, I have your consent to send you a gazillion emails about 30 different topics. You actually have to get consent for each specific topic. So in the screenshot here, and we'll take a look at this in Sugar in just a second, you have to track what type of communications you have consent to send to this person, this contact. And another thing I'm going to show is how do I view the personal information for a contact, that PII data within Sugar. They've added a new view to the drop down next to the edit where you can get that information. So let's take a look at that. Here I am on a contact, Malcolm Clinton. I have a drop down here for business purposes consented for. And this is just a standard drop down. You can edit these fields or drop down values as you see fit. And save those values and use this for your marketing email campaigns or your phone campaigns or mailing campaigns. 
This consent last updated does not automatically update. You have to manually update it. You could add code that would let you automatically update it if you wanted to. But it's important to make sure you're tracking this information for compliance. And again, under the edit drop down here, there's a new item called view personal information. That's going to show you all of the different information as well as the source for it. So for example, here it's showing me Chris Oliver typed in the name Malcolm Clinton and when it was last updated. So it's got a bit of that tracking in it as what well. using this with your change log you can see all of the different changes through history but this is just showing us the most recent information and who did that and that view is one of the ways you could respond to someone's request for what data you're tracking about them is you can pull up that view and you can print it off and mail it to them or you can copy and paste it into an email uh, or an Excel file and send it to them that way. Uh, so that's certainly a way that you could handle that request. Something else that GDPR specifically touches on is opt-ins. So the ability of someone to opt in. Um, and in particular, GDPR requires that someone specifically consents to be opted in to specific groups or tracking of data or marketing campaigns and so on. Uh, so this ties to that consent field that Justin was just showing you. But this is something that is a pretty significant change for marketing departments versus what they have been able to do in the past, which was kind of just assume consent. Um, GDPR requires that someone specifically select to opt in to give you their information and to be included in marketing campaigns and so on. Um, as you might know, when you put a new email address into Sugar, by default that email address is marked as opted in. And so that's a potential conflict with what GDPR requires. Um, and therefore Sugar has added a new setting that allows you to default new email addresses to opt it out instead of opted in. Now that's going to opt them out from campaigns that you might be sending through Sugar's campaigns modules. Um, or if you have a marketing tool integrated with Sugar and one of the data fields that that marketing tool syncs is the opt-in, opt-out flag, uh, it's going to be really important that you are tracking that correctly in Sugar. If you're not using Sugar for marketing lists, the setting may not be as relevant to you. Um, but if you are, again, this is going to be important for making sure that you are defaulting correctly to opting out as opposed to opting in. And another setting that Sugar has added with Sugar 8 is the option to disable activity stream. Um, this goes back to the idea that the erasure flow does not currently delete data from the activity stream, and the activity stream could contain some of that PII data. So the erasure flow does delete PII data from the audit logs, um, but not from the activity stream, at least in the 8.0 release. And therefore, again, if GDPR compliance is something that you are worried about, which you should be, you probably have data on some EU citizens in your database somewhere, um, you may need to disable the activity stream through this new setting uh, until Sugar provides a better solution for this. That is something they are definitely considering for an upcoming release, uh, having a more fine-grained solution or erasing the data from uh, the activity stream in some way. So it is certainly something they are considering, but at least in the 8.0 release, uh, the only way to keep PII data out of activity stream is to disable it altogether. All right, and then one last slide here related to GDPR features, and this is an important one. Uh, most, if not all, of these GDPR features in Sugar 8 need to be enabled by you when you upgrade to Sugar 8. So most of them are not enabled by default. Uh, the data privacy, module, data privacy module needs to be enabled in the Display Modules Administrator tool. It's going to be hidden by default. Uh, that Data Privacy Manager role, you may need to add users to that role so that they have access to do that erasing of data. That opt-out new email addresses 
by default setting is under system email settings under the administrator tools. Um, the activity stream setting, I'll jump down to that one for a second, is under admin system settings to disable the activity stream. And then marking fields that contain PII data so that they're included in that PII view and in the erasure flow, that's done through Studio. So you need to go through each of your modules and mark whatever fields contain that personally identifiable information. All right, and I think that wraps up everything we've got on Sugar 8. So Justin's gonna give you a little bit of information about a couple of other new releases. Thank you, Megan. Uh, just a couple of new releases since our last user group. I imagine they've been working on Sugar version 8 quite a bit. Uh, so Sugar 7.9.4.0, that was a security patch for Sugar 7.9, which is an on-premise version of Sugar. Uh, so that's a very important one to get out there. It contained five uh, potential issues where authenticated or unauthenticated users could gain access to run any arbitrary code or SQL on a Sugar instance. And if there's one surefire way of making the GDPR compliance people angry, it's to have a data breach. Uh, also, Hint 4.0 was released. And that included a couple of new features. Uh, specifically, now the administrator can configure how the Hint dashboard looks. So if there's a field you know for accounts, contacts, or leads that your people would never use. You can just drag that off the screen and get rid of it. It also includes a product tour that will present whenever your users next log in. It's not really a new release, but Sugar 7.8 reached its end of life on March 31st. Uh, so if you're still on 7.8 or any older versions, you probably really want to start upgrading because you're not getting those security fixes like we just saw for 7.9.4.0. And I'm not sure if we mentioned it, but in case you're wondering when version 8 is coming out, that's due out within the next week or two, certainly before GDPR goes into effect on, I believe, the 25th of next month. And I would also expect, based on what we've seen with the last few releases, that you'll see a number of related releases uh, shortly after Sugar releases Sugar 8. So we've seen the last few releases have been followed by mobile releases, Outlook plugin releases. Um, we already saw the Hint release, but some of the other plugins, Marketo, um, Customer Journey, and so on, uh, have been having releases shortly following each new Sugar release with updated versions that are compliant with the latest Sugar release. So. Um, if you do use any of those plugins, you know, do keep an eye out for updates to those as well that you may need to install when Sugar 8 is available. Yes, and I don't know if um, if you guys have the information on this yet, but we did have a question asking if the Outlook Sync tool is going to be fixed so that the sales teams can sync their contacts from Outlook. Do you have, do, have you heard anything about that? I don't have any information about any specific effects that you might be dealing with with the Outlook plugin. Um, but again, I would expect that there probably will be an Outlook plugin release uh, shortly after the 8.0 release. Whether or not that will address the specific issue that's being asked about, I, I don't know. OK, so um, now we're going to go over some upcoming events, and I'm going to kick that off real quick as we breeze through this, these last few minutes of our uh, presentation today. If I've done my job correctly, which I hope I have, most of you should know already that we have a workshop at our offices May 15th, 16th, and 17th. If you don't know, um, May 15th, uh, we're setting aside a day for one-on-one um, -on -one meetings that you can schedule. Um, when you register, you can you can enter all that information. If there's if there's a specific topic you want to talk about with any of our sugar experts, um, you know we'll we'll put that time aside for you for an in-person meeting to talk about whatever you like. Um, then on the 16th, that's the day we're going to do the workshop. We'll be uh, getting into this uh, GDPR a little bit more. We'll be showing some of the features in sugar with the GDPR. 
Um, one of the hot topics I'm seeing a lot of people interested in is the account-based marketing presentation. That's going to be presented by Acton. Um, we'll be talking about using analytics with your CRM. Um, we'll give you some ideas for different integrations you can use that can simplify your sales processes, um, your marketing, your services. And then we're also going to have a Sugar CRM rep here to go over what you can expect in their product roadmap and their upcoming releases. So, you know, those questions that you have as outliers, uh, for example, the Outlook question, maybe they will be able to answer that for you uh, at that time. And then on the 17th, um, we're offering some free training opportunities from our staff um, on various topics. And, uh, you know, those of you who have been with us uh, for a while, you know we've been doing this event for several years. We had our last event in the autumn of last year, which is why this event we're going to hold at our offices. It's kind of close together, and it's going to be a little bit more of an intimate environment. Um, so we hope that you will join us. If, if you do plan to register, I very much encourage you to register soon um, because the space at our offices is limited, so we're going to have to cap it after a certain point, and we're, we're on our way there right now. So um, again, our Dates are the 15th, 16th, and 17th. Um, mostly the 16th is the actual workshop, 15th for meeting, 17th for training. And I will make sure to include that registration link in the follow-up email as well if you have not seen it already. And as always, remember SugarCon is coming up October 10th and 11th of this year in Las Vegas. Las Vegas is a little easier to get to than San Francisco and hopefully a little cheaper, so I hope to see everyone there. It's a lot of fun and uh, very educational. And also, as always, we do have a number of upcoming training classes posted on our website. I believe currently I've posted dates through June, so within the next few weeks I need to go ahead and post dates out for the rest of the year, so you'll see those available shortly. And then with our event coming up uh, in May, we will update you on the next user group uh, as we get to that. Um, we're going to focus on the on the May workshop right now, and then we will get our next user group in the books and get you information about it. So we appreciate your time today. We hope that this has been helpful for you. As always, if you have any questions or concerns going forward, um, I hope you will reach out to us and let us know. In the meantime, uh, have a wonderful rest of your week and uh, a great rest of your day. And thank you to Megan and Justin. Thank you.